Happy Father's Day. <clears throat> you've already heard that once, twice, maybe five times today. I'm not really sure uh, how many times you've heard that today, but I am excited to share this word today. I have had this on my heart for several months, so for the opportunity now to share it, I am excited to release this word to you. <clears throat> A few things as we kind of introduce the message today. One is I want to share some st statistics with you. This is a uh, survey from 2016 conducted by uh, Dr. Dobson, James Dobson. Some of you know him. Uh, he was the host of Focus on the Family for decades. Uh, but here are some of the things that they discovered in their survey. So here are some of the questions or the results they had. So in this survey, the, these were the three top things that moms had said or a wife had said concerning their husband. So 59% of the time, <clears throat> the mom said regarding the husband that she would want family leadership skills in her husband. Okay, so the number one thing the wife wanted was family leadership skills. The second thing right behind it was that they were, there would be a, a less physical activity or work stress in their husband's life. How many husbands know that'd be a good thing? <clears throat> Amen, right? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, that the, the, the wife was wanting less stress for their husband, that they wouldn't be able to bring work home with them, okay? That was the second thing. The third thing is they wanted their husband to be a Christian role model. Those are the three things that were on the hearts of the wife, okay? The husbands, they had replied to this survey as their top three needs, and what they recognized was, uh, just as the women, that family leadership skills was number one. They recognized that was lacking in their life. So that was the first thing. The second thing is they, they wanted spiritual training for their children. They recognized they were lacking in spiritual training of their children. And then the third thing is they wanted more time with their family. So how many know that's all very important? And sometimes if we were to answer those, we would realize that we're probably lacking in some of those areas as well, or that we know we would need these uh, I found this survey to be really interesting, and my whole sermon is going to be based around these kind of these priorities, these things here. And our mindset needs to be that as a parent, I would rather build guardrails at the top of the cliff than build hospitals at the bottom. You understand? That our kids are going to have to go out and fly and learn how to live on their own. I would rather have the guardrails up here and not have hospitals down here, meaning if there's hospitals, I'm not doing my job that I let them fall. You get that? Okay, uh, so a key word in all of this that you want to have kind of captured in your heart is intentionality. That as parents, if we're not intentional in raising our kids, guess who's going to raise them for us? The world. And on social media, they go by titles like influencer. They don't go by the word role model or any of those. They go by influencer, and they have millions of followers, Okay, so you need to understand that if you're not the primary influence in your kid's life, somebody else will be that for them. And so you have to take that ownership as a parent, and we're going to jump into all that today. Another thing I want to share with you is this, is that uh, as a disclaimer, uh, I am not perfect. So uh, sometimes, I know, that's shocking. You, there's a gasp, you know, there's a gasp. Uh, <clears throat> And contrary to popular, popular belief, I am not perfect. And sometimes as, uh, you know, as churchgoers, we, we tend to think that the preacher always has it all together. Oftentimes, we're, we're sharing with you what God's thumping us over the head with. So as I share my message with you today, understand that I'm trying to practice the very things I'm preaching. I'm in the same boat with you. So don't think like I have all these things down and I'm doing these things perfectly that's just not the case, okay? So understand that. Uh, another thing I want to do is I want to give a shout out to a couple of my friends. They don't go to church here, uh, but Ben Neff and Chad Stolly, you may know them or not know them, but uh, they have a podcast called uh, Manhood Restored, and I enjoy listening to those two. Uh, I've known Chad since high school, a long time ago, so I've known him for over 20 years. He's a great brother. Uh, he attends the Catholic Church and then Ben Neff attends the Church of God at Mount Tabor. Uh, but they do a great job. So if you don't have a podcast to listen to, uh, you can go on Spotify and search Manhood Restored. And they have a lot of great podcasts. There's 90 plus podcasts. So they're doing a great job with that. So I just want to put that out there for you uh, to know that. <clears throat> this is a Father's Day message. 
you might be thinking, well, I'm a female or I'm a, you know, I'm a youth that doesn't apply to me. Do you know the Holy Spirit can still teach you through different things, even though it might not be directly to you? Okay, uh, so don't sit there and check out. So I need you to have an open heart and be receiving and realize that this is for all ages and both genders. And notice I didn't say all ages and all genders. <laughs> I said all ages and both genders. Okay, uh, and understand that that's important to know and, and grasp. So uh, to start this out with, if I was the devil <clears throat> and I wanted to get my end goal, my, what's the, the devil's end goal? Yep, and he wants you where? <clears throat> he wants you in hell. That's, that's the end goal. Why? He hates he who created us. If you want to get to me, go after my kids. Right? That's the tactic of the devil, that if he can't get to God anymore, he's going to go after his, his creation. So as God's creation, his number one tactic is to come after you. And if he wants to create chaos and destruction in the world, what do you think he's going to do? What would be one of his number one things? Attack the family, right? Has the family not been under assault for, what now, decades? Just constant over and over and over. And the Homer Simpson of the world is what is portrayed as the, the white male of today, right? That, that's what you know, people think of a lot of times. They're trying to portray that, that dumb and, and just you know, doesn't know what's going on in life type of mentality of what a man is. And I'm here to tell you that that's not how God views it, okay? And that God wants to preserve family and that the, if the devil's gonna go after that, wouldn't it be wise for us to kind of get a clue and try to protect the very thing that is sacred? If you can protect your family and if you can keep dad and mom together, the chances of your kids doing really well in life are good, right? I wanna share some uh, statistics with you in regards to what happens when dad and mom get separated. And please understand this, I understand that Life is what it is, and there uh, can be divorce, and there's different things that take place, and so I, my goal is not to make you feel shame or to feel bad if you're in this room and that's been part of your life, okay? But st statistically, there are facts that children that are raised in a godly home where a husband models the ideal, where they lay down their life for their wife, okay? That's a good thing to remember, and, and she's able to follow that lead. If those two do that, more than likely the children will turn out pretty good if they see that. And we're going to go through some of these things. But uh, looking at what happens when dad is taken out of the picture, uh, on a scientific level, uh, by age 12, they say that the, and I've, I'll try to pronounce this right, I'm not a scientist, but the telomeres, they're the, the end part of your chromosome. They're, the, they're an indicator of how long your life will go. They say that by age 12 for a boy, their telomeres are about 10 to 12% reduced. That's pretty interesting. So they, they go on the end of your chromosome and they scientifically can prove that those are reduced in the life of a boy who doesn't have a father at home. In the life of a girl, they say that, they, that she will start puberty about approximately one to two years prior to when she normally would start without a dad in home. That's on a scientific level. Now, on, <clears throat> on other levels, suicide. 63% of all youth suicide comes from a fatherless home. Wow, 63%. Just kind of let that number sink in. Abortions. One out of every three pregnancies in a fatherless home end in abortion. Think about that. Let that sink in. You know, we're on the front end of trying to prevent some of these things. Here's the number one way to prevent it. Have a godly home. Okay, and again, I'm not trying to shame or anything. I'm just sharing these things. Okay, drug and, and illegal gun use. Children without a father are 279% more likely to deal drugs and illegally carry firearms. Prison. 85% of youth in prison come from a fatherless home. Isn't that number crazy? 85% of youth in prison come from a fatherless home. The transgender drag queen movement. I don't have a statistic for this, but this is my personal research that when I read the testimony of an individual who has come out from that movement and they're testifying to the power of Jesus Christ and they're sharing their testimony, 
I have read almost every single time in their testimony, they share about when they grew up, they either had a dad that was abusive, a dad that wasn't there, or uh, a dad that was there but not present. You know what I mean? They, they did the bare minimum of providing you know, a roof and food, which is good. You know, good thing you're doing a roof and food, but that's just the start. Okay, you, you, you got a child into the world, but now you have to do the hard part in raising them. Uh, so looking at that, uh, you see that that's part of their testimony of the drag queens and the transgender is that it's a fatherless movement because if the father was in their life and teaching them godly principles, that wouldn't exist. This Saturday when they have their parade downtown in Salina, that wouldn't exist if we did our job, Right? You want to end some of these things? It starts in our homes. It starts in my home. It starts in your home. How do you change a community? One home at a time. But it starts with your life, you surrendering to Christ, and then you taking personal responsibility for your house, for your home. It is not the responsibility of the pastor or the youth pastor or even youth camp. It is a false notion if you think you can send your kid to youth camp and they're going to come back a Christian. That's a fault on you if you think that's the case. Will it benefit them? Yes. Will it be the thing that keeps them serving the Lord the rest of their life? No. You are. As parents, as grandparents, you have the responsibility to do that. Uh, So for us, when we look at this What does this result in? This results where kids are turning to drugs, sex, alcohol, everything to fill the void, wanting the validation of a father. That's what they want. In certain areas of America, in our country, there's upwards of 90% of the kids in the community don't have a father. Think about that. There's cities around Houston that have 90% where they don't have a father in the home. There's approximately 25% of children that don't have a dad at home in America, 25%. There's about 71 million or so kids in America. It's estimated 18 million don't have a dad at home. Ain't that something? 18 million kids don't have a father at home. And we wonder why things are messed up. We wonder why there's school shootings and all these things. It's because you destroy the family unit and you have all chaos ensue. Now, they, you still could have a kid be raised in a godly home and still have, you know, maybe go through things. And that's a possibility, but the chances are lower, okay? That they're lower when there's a godly home. So there's an incentive for us to raise our children in godly ways. There's an incentive for us to maintain as much as we can, you know, the ideal picture of what God wants. And again, As I share the ideal, sometimes we can feel shame and guilt because we're not there. But just because we're not there doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. Right? Okay? We still should talk about the ideal of what is God's ideal plan and what is his his perfect plan. Uh, And we understand this, that a house divided will, will what? It'll fall. A house divided will fall. Do you think the devil knows that? So what do you think his job's gonna be? Do you think he takes days off? Does he think, do you believe that he assigns certain demons and devils to your household? Yes. We have to wake up to the reality that the supernatural realm is real. That you can't bury your head in the sand and just say, well, I hope it kind of goes past my house. Your house is on his list. You men are on his list. You women are on his list. Like, don't play games with the supernatural, that it's real. It exists, and so I want to encourage you that, that you have to take responsibility for your life, okay, and, and, and really own what, what we're going to talk about here. So a definition of a real man. Uh, we're going to talk about fatherhood and manhood, and again, the things that I'm going to share with you are all things God's putting on my heart. So understand I'm not throwing stones, and I'm also not saying I'm doing all these things well, and you can ask my wife, okay? Do it later, though, not in front of everyone, uh, but... Uh, The definition of a real man, let's talk about manhood. Let's talk about fatherhood, because I believe this is on the heart of God. I do. This message has been on my heart for months. I have been so excited to jump into this message, 
And today just happened to be Father's Day, and it all has come together perfectly. So uh, looking at the definition of a real man, is it being super strong, being like Arnold, I'll be back, right? Is it being Arnold? Uh, is it the ability to drink copious amounts of alcohol, you know, as a teenager? That makes you a real man. You can drink. No. Being able to drink or uh, smoke a cigar, does that make you a man? No. Being able to date a girl and find your validation from that relationship, does that make you a man? No. Being able to have lots of money, does that make you a man? Nope. doesn't. I would suggest all those do not at all. And I would like to suggest what is. And to do that, we're going to look at the perfect example, and his name is Jesus. Do you know Jesus had none of the above four that we just mentioned? He didn't need any of that stuff. He said, look, the Son of Man, he doesn't have a place to put his head. He didn't have to have cars, houses, money, girls, fame. The Bible even says that his appearance was not that attractive. His appearance wasn't like, oh, I want to follow him because you know, he, he's 6'5 and looks real good. Right? That wasn't the case. It just says you know, that, that he just had a normal look to him. You know, Jesus. So he didn't have any of those things. So looking at our example, Jesus, uh, you're going to find as I list some of these things, you're not going to measure up. And you're going to find that you're, you're lacking in some of these areas. Don't beat yourself up over that, but just make it a goal of yours that, man, I want to be able to be like Jesus. You know, in the 90s, there's always be like Mike, okay? Well, be like Jesus, okay? Uh, and, and so looking at the life of Jesus, you're going to need to take a deep breath as we go through these things and tell yourself it's going to be okay. We're looking at what is the standard, and more than likely, you're going to find yourself falling short in some of these, these areas, but it's okay. Just don't give up. Have the right mindset that I don't need to be perfect as a dad, but I need to be present, and being present but not absent. That's my goal. Okay, I'm not shooting for perfection, but I want to, as much as I can, exemplify the life of Jesus because he's the best one to exemplify. If you're going to ever look for someone to exemplify their life, it's the life of Jesus. He is the best example. So looking at the life of Jesus, here's, I just made a, a short list of things that, I, that stood out to me. So if you were to make your list, maybe it would be a little different. But here's the things that stood out to me. Number one that really stood out to me was that a real man is one that has sacrificial love, that they demonstrate sacrificial love, that their ability to lay their life down for another, that's the definition of a real man, that they don't don't look out simply for themselves, but they're looking out for those in their life, that how can my life benefit your life? That was the life of Jesus. He wasn't sitting there thinking, how can this relationship benefit me if me and you are in relationship? But isn't that how we form relationships a lot of times? What can I get out of this relationship? Jesus didn't live that way. He lived in such a way that he wanted you to benefit from him being in your life. Wow, that is the standard. So a couple verses that we'll look at, uh, Philippians 2. So we'll go to Philippians 2, chapter 1. Maybe this is familiar with you. Maybe it's not. All right, Philippians 2, verse 1 and following. So therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any uh, affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done with a selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others, what? Better than. Who are you to do this for? Others. Your neighbors. Who's your neighbors? Everyone. Those in your sphere of influence. Those that are in your life. That you're to treat them better than yourselves. Question, how are you doing with that? Ask yourself, be honest in your heart right now. How are you doing with this? Are you esteeming others better than you? I'm checking my heart too. So, okay, verse four, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but the interests of the other. You're looking out for the other person's interest. That I, uh, what is a concern to you? True love is when you know the heart of the other person. When you listen long enough to know their needs. 
If all you do is express your needs, that's not true love, that's selfish. You're simply just putting your needs on them. No, true love is you taking the time to learn the people that are in your life. What a powerful verse this is. And then verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in who? Christ Jesus. This was our example, is our example, that this mind was in Christ Jesus, who was in the form of God, yet did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a bondservant. He didn't come here to be served, which leads me into the next, uh, the next point, is that you have, number one is sacrificial love. Number two is a servant's heart. That he came, that we just read this verse here, that he came as a servant. He didn't come here to get something out of a relationship. He came to give. And we'll look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter 20, <clears throat> verse uh, 26, and we'll kind of see this mindset of Jesus. Chapter 20, verse 26. Yet it shall not be among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be what? A servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be a what? Slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and gave his life up for many. Question, how are you doing with that? How am I doing with that? How are we serving one another and being passionate about it? Not just because you have to. Well, I'll serve you because I have to. All right? The pastor said you got to serve. Uh, you know, and God's twisting your arm behind your back. Listen, God's not going to twist your arm. He's a gentleman. I'll never twist your arm. Pastor Jason's never going to twist your arm. But we're going to give you recommendations from the scripture. And do you think this is a suggestion from God or a command? It's a command to do what? To serve. To lay down your life for the benefit of other people. If we could just do these top two things, we would probably change the world. Or at least transform our community. Because when there's broken boys and girls, that leads to broken homes. Broken homes lead to broken communities. And if you want to fix our community, start with your home. Start with your, your family. Start where you're at, that you can do this, that you're able to do this, whether you're a parent, a grandparent, uh, that these things are, this is on the heart of God, that this is something that he's passionate about, that Jesus role modeled this. He role modeled what it meant to be a servant. Going to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. How are we doing today? Doing good? Okay. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4.1. Let, uh, let a man so consider us as what? Servants. Wow. And stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, so here's God's expectation of you as a servant, as a steward, that you would be found faithful. Wow. Isn't God simple? This isn't really that hard. That as a servant, you would be found, say it with me, faithful. Say it again. As a servant, I would be found faithful. God has an expectation for you to be faithful. So that leads me to the third point here is, of the life of Jesus, that, that he was a faithful person. He was trustworthy. That when Jesus said something, you could trust him. That you could count on him. That if he said, hey, I'm gonna meet you here, he would meet you there. If he said something, it was gonna come to pass. You as husbands, I'm speaking to you as husbands, does your wife trust you? Are you faithful? Faithful with your words, faithful with your thoughts, faithful with your eyes, Right? There's an expectation of faithfulness that we would be a trustworthy person, that, that this is something that God wants us to settle in our heart, that you would sacrifice your life, that you would serve with your life, and that you would be faithful. And it leads to this fourth thing that, you know, Pastor Jason preached this years ago, uh, but rejecting passivity. A real man rejects passivity. What do I mean by that? A lot of times I'll hear someone say something like, well, I'll just let their mom raise the kids. I'll, I'll make sure there's food on the table. I'll make sure there's a roof over their head. But when it comes to the kids, their mom's in charge, and I'm going to just take a back seat to that, that you being passive. You know your kids need you just as much as mom. You understand that? 
my kids, my daughter needs me to get down when she, like, she wants to play Barbies. Guess what I do? <laughs> I play Barbies, right? It's not real manly, but I'm, I'm playing Barbies. And lately, you know, she's been sewing little dresses to put on them. And so we get a look at the dresses sewn and put the dresses on them. And it's pretty neat. It's cool. But I do that. Now, do I really, really enjoy it? Mm, it's okay. Uh, you know, uh, but do I like when they set up the army guys and we shoot them with rubber bands? Yes. Yes. I like that a lot more. But as parents, as fathers, if you have little kids, get on their level. You know, don't sit there and say things like, well, once they become a teenager, then I'll start to connect with them. Too late. If you're waiting to connect with your kids when they're a teenager, you have missed it, okay? Uh, I would encourage you, there's a book uh, titled Already Gone by Ken Ham, and he documents that point, that they did a survey, and it was a very um, well-done survey, and I'll let you borrow this. I'll put it in Pastor Doyle's library back there, so first come, first serve. Uh, but it's a great book, and the point of it is this. They did a... Uh, a survey on why are kids leaving the faith? Because I've shared this with you many times, that about eight out of 10 Christian kids are leaving the faith. Okay, that's a number that even is true among our church. And so they're trying to find out why are kids leaving the faith? And what they discovered is it's not a matter of why they are, it's when they are. And so the point or the title of the book is already gone. They already checked out in seventh and eighth grade. They already checked out in seventh and eighth grade. So if you're waiting until then to try to like, oh, connect with them now that they're older, too late. They are already gone. You missed it. Now, could God redeem the time and could you make up for it? Yes. So, but I don't want to be playing catch up. Okay. Let's stay ahead of the, ahead of the curve. Many times as Christians, we, we are very reactionary. Do you understand that? A principle of leadership, though, is not to be reactionary, but to be proactive, that you proactively do things. You don't wait for a crisis to happen. You prevent a crisis. I would rather realize that my tire is low in air and go get it filled up before I'm driving on the highway and it's flat. Understand? Don't wait till you have a crisis with your kids and then try to deal with it, but prevent it before it happens. Uh, so this is a great book. Uh, you, know, you can check it out. There's at least one there. You can order them. I think they're like $10 online. Uh, but reject passivity that you, would, that you would lead. The next thing is to lead courageously. That's the fifth thing. That as a husband, as a man, that you would face your fears. You would face your emotions. Because let's face it, a lot of times we like to put a front on on the outside that everything's good, that we're fine, uh, that we're strong, that we're macho, that we're, we're able to do everything. But truthfully, there's probably a lot of insecurities that we all have on the inside. And there's a lot of things that we're dealing with. And as men, we're macho, just like you saw in the video. They don't ask for directions, do we? Been there, done that. I'm not, look, I'm not asking for directions. We're just going to be lost and we'll figure it out. Now that we have iPhones, it's a little easier. But I remember back in the day, my dad and I, we got lost somewhere and we figured it out eventually. All right. We missed our exit and we, we made it, but it took a little bit. Uh, but we didn't want to stop for directions. And we eventually did. Uh, but... <laughs> The point is, as, as men, sometimes we like to conceal everything and, and act strong and mighty, but the truth is, we also need to be vulnerable with one another as men to share things and even be vulnerable with your wife and share things and as women, be a safe place for them to share stuff, okay? Now, what if you're not married? This still applies to you. You understand that, right? Even if this, you're not married, being vulnerable and finding someone to confide in is a good thing. Okay, this isn't just for married couples. Uh, so leading courageously is that you face your fears. You face the things that are inside you. Don't hold them down and be like, oh, well, I can just deal with it. I'll handle it. If you got stuff going on in your life, deal with it. Embrace it and be like, it's just part of the journey, okay? Uh, number six, I've mentioned this already, but uh, you accept responsibility for your life. Don't blame other people for where you're at in life. Accept responsibility for what's going on in your life and begin to move forward. Uh, there's an old proverb I like, and it's this. There are two ideal times to plant an apple tree, either 20 years ago, and if not 20 years ago, the next best time is to start today. That if you haven't done the right things in the past, 
Now is the day to start. Don't sit there and say, well, tomorrow I'll work on that. Tomorrow doesn't come and it's not a present moment. You have to make a decision in the present moment to start today. Start what? Doing these things that we just talked about. It's not too late. If you're breathing, it's not too late. If you're alive, it's not too late. And the last thing, number seven, is expect God's reward. That I live life with a certain expectation. And I've shared this, I think, in the last sermon, is that I live with an understanding that I'm going to present my, my family, my immediate family, to the Lord. Do you understand? I have an expectation that everything I do is tethered to the eternal realm. Every word I speak, every action I do is is connected to eternity that I'm trying to understand that there's a day that I'm gonna present my family and hopefully I present them better than I found them, right? Scripture says, husbands, and I'll read it here in a minute, you know, Ephesians 5, that you are to wash your wife in the water of the word, that it's our responsibility to do that. So I carry what I think one of the heaviest responsibilities that I'm very aware of is that I have an obligation to present my immediate family to the Lord whole and complete, that they are eternal beings. And I also assume that responsibility, even within our local body, within spiritual sons and daughters, that there's an expectation that when the roll call is named out and when the names are getting called, I want to hear your names on that day. Do you understand that? That there is an expectation that that when I am walking out this life, whether I die by an accident or why I, whether I die by natural causes, that day when I go before the Heavenly Father, I want to present to him all that was put in my care. And I want no regrets and I want no shame. I want to be able to stand before God unashamed of that I lived this life the best I could, God, and I gave you everything I could and I faced everything I could face, and I, I lived the way a man should live. I fulfilled my calling. So many times we're trying to find our purpose and our calling, all these different things. You know the very basic place is just to start with your, your specific call. Are you a male or a female? Are you married or unmarried? If you're married, that's one of your highest callings. If you're unmarried, that's still fine, but your highest calling is to represent Christ. Just start there. That's so simple, but so many times we want to do this or do that. You know, our Kingdom Harvest Ministries, Destiny School of Ministry, I could live life without them. The only reason I do them is because I'm called to them. That's it. So if God hasn't called you to something of that nature, don't worry about it. It's not your responsibility to worry about that. Do the things that are right in front of you. Don't worry about the things that are out of your control or out of your reach. So understanding this, that for each of us, Uh, We got to eliminate the excuses, and it's time for all of us, us men, to man up. And this is the word the Lord's been speaking to me over and over and over. To me, to Justin, man up, level up. You got to go to the next level. That's a word for me. I'm sharing it with you that we cannot have excuses and say, well, you know, maybe somewhere else. No, it's my responsibility to do that. So our mindset is this is that we need to be present. God hates lip service. God hates lip service. Jesus said of the people of his day, your lips are what? Near me, but your hearts are far from me. Can't give lip service to God anymore. This is a serious matter that he has his finger on, that it ain't just in word only, but it also has to be in deed, that that our actions have to follow the things that we're saying. Uh, So the promise is this that it is the faithfulness of the previous generation that will produce the fruitfulness of the upcoming generation. What does that mean? That if I be faithful with my children and my generation, it will cause the next generation to be fruitful. You understand that? That there is a promise of that if I am found faithful, the next generation gets to reap the benefit and the rewards of being fruitful. But if I be found unfaithful, what are they going to reap? Unfruitful. Chaos. Destruction. Okay? So the challenge is for me to start this within my home and my, my family. Uh, so some statements that you can make to your children, and it doesn't matter what age your kids are, whether they're 10 or 20 or 30. Here's some statements your kids would love to hear. I love you. 
Do you know how many grown men come into my office and, and share how they just wish their parents, and even women, that they would just wish their parents would say, I love you? They just want to hear, and I love you. You know what else they want to hear? I'm proud of you. I am proud of the man or woman you've become. Most of us all long for that. That to hear those words from your parents, your validation of your parents, and Jesus got that. His heavenly father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. He gave his son the validation that he needed. Uh, so looking at some practical things, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here, is uh, those are the seven things that I would say consider that make up manhood, okay? And it all looks to the life of Jesus. So I would encourage you, as you read through the Gospels, maybe there's other things that stand out to you. Maybe there's other things that, that pop out to you from the, the Scripture, like, oh, that's a definition of a real man. Well, then add that into your own mix of what you want, what you want to add. But uh, Jesus is our ultimate example. He is the one that we look to. Uh, so kind of, uh, if you will, sh shift gears with me. I want to go from manhood to fatherhood. And here's, uh, and I'll go through these quickly. I know we're uh, going a little long here, but... Uh, in regards to uh, fatherhood, I owe this, this person, uh, his name is Chip Wynott from uh, Columbus. Uh, Pastor Jason and I and, and Tom, we went down to Columbus uh, several months ago. We sat at a random table uh, with about, I don't know, 100 people or so, somewhere in there. And this individual was there, and we started making conversation, and we both are, are involved in release time and, and different things. And we ended up having a meeting scheduled to deal with a release time, if you will, a crisis, and we deal with that meeting. Well, he and you know the other people leave, and Chip and I are just sitting there. So this is back in, I don't know, whatever month, January. So January, Chip and I are just sitting there, and he said something real quick to me, and he just kind of caught my ear, and I thought, huh, I wonder, I'm going to follow up on that statement. But he was talking about fatherhood and dads, and he just said, yeah, real, real fathers, you know, they're going to lead their wife in, you know, connecting with Christ, you know, the calendar, the checkbook, uh, the children in conflict. And he just routed it off real quick. And then he kept going and we talked about something else. But that statement like stuck in my heart of like, I think I need to follow up on that statement that he just made. So I asked him and we ended up doing a Zoom call. And for the last several months via Zoom, he's been teaching me a lot of the things that he's been doing for decades. And so I kind of owe this uh, to him of just ideas that he shared. It was a God connection. And it's been something I've been trying to practice on a regular basis uh, in my household. Uh, also, somewhere down the road, we are going to, these principles, we're going to try and find a, a one-day workshop, maybe for like three hours or so, to teach you these things more in depth. I'm simply going to go through them on a general sense right now. Uh, and what am I speaking of? How to practically lead your home. So uh, Chip calls this dad lab. So say dad lab. Dad lab. Dad lab. Lab as in laboratory that you're practicing. That this is a practice that you're going to work at this, that you're going to try to practically put these things into play. So uh, the three things that I'm going to share today, there's more, but these are just the three. The three lifestyle habits of every father. This is the first one. And I'll, I'll say it and then I'll go through them all. But the first one is... As a father, that you model your relationship with Jesus Christ. So that was the very first healthy lifestyle habit of every father is to model your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is that simple? Yeah, should be. I mean, if you're, if you're a committed follower of Jesus, you should be able to model that. So that was the first thing. The second thing he said and that is taught in Dad Lab is that as a husband, you lead your wife. Novel idea, isn't it? Right, it's in the Bible. Okay, uh, that you would lead your wife through a, a weekly uh, meetup. Now, and I'll break down what that all that entails. And then the third thing is, as a father, you will disciple your children on a on a weekly basis, where you're going to set a time aside to disciple your kids. Those are kind of the three core habits of every father within what we he would call Dad Lab of what we need to do. So let's look at the first thing. Daily discipleship with Jesus, model this. Do you know that it's a monkey see, monkey do relationship between you and your kids? My son will stand in front of the TV on a Saturday around noon and he'll yell at the TV. <laughs> do you know why he does that? He's seen it done before. <laughs> and you know who's yelling at the TV and those dumb refs? <laughs> this guy, <laughs> right? 
Do you know why my son's a Buckeye fan? Because of me and Elizabeth, right? He didn't come out of the womb going, oh, H-I-O, right? You know, they don't do that. You have to kind of train them that. You know, he's a Bengals fan, right? Who day? You know, all you Browns fans, sorry. Okay. But why is he a Bengals fan? Because we watch him and we go to the game and he sees it and we go to the Sullivan's house and have a great time, right? Uh, And so they're that way because we program them. We program them to care about the things we care about. And so this whole idea of model Christianity, Jesus even said this, I do what? What my father's doing. So he tells us, I modeled what my father showed me. So Christianity is a model-based religion, that it's something you model, and then people repeat. Jesus went out, he laid hands on the sick, then he healed them. He said to his disciples, go and do what I've shown you. He modeled what he wanted. So understanding this is that, that within this first thing is you have to model it, meaning if your kids aren't praying, the question you ask yourself is, well, do they see me praying? When's the last time your children saw you on your knees praying out and crying out to God? That's a question you have to ask yourself. And I ask myself that, and I'm like, hmm, not very much. <laughs> okay? And so now I'm trying to model what that looks like. And so what does that mean? I'm intentionally praying in front of my children, and it's awesome. My heart is overjoyed when Leah comes over to me and she kneels down next to me and she prays. It is awesome. I think it was two days ago, I'm sitting at the kitchen table and I'm reading my Bible at the kitchen table and Leah comes out and she gets her Bible and sits right down next to me. And she's like, where should I read? And I'm like, you pick, honey. You know where she picked? Song of Solomon. (laughs) She read chapter one. She goes, dad, what does this mean? And I'm like, Leah, I was like, let's go to Psalms. (laughs) We're doing a quick audible. (laughs) We're not reading Song of Solomon. I was like, premature. So we're going to the chapter one of the book of Psalm. And we read that. Uh, so uh, you got to give a little guidance on where to go. I don't know why she picked that one, but she was excited. <laughs> so, uh, but the thing is that, and, and sometimes you might say things like, well, why would I want to do that in front of them? I'll get distracted or it's hard. And it is. They'll bug you and like, dad, what about this? And you just, you answer it, but you keep moving. Why? I want them to see me doing these things. Not, not for show, not whatever, but I want my children to see it modeled. And so I'm trying to role model, being on my knees, reading the word, demonstrating what that is, demonstrating kindness to people that they see this, okay? So it's a model-based religion. Next thing, uh, weekly discipleship. This is the thing that really caught my attention with Chip is uh, he has the five C's uh, or seven C's of, of Dad Lab. And what this is, is that it's a one hour meetup every week with your bride, that you're intentional about certain topics. And so here, here they are, uh, Christ connection. You know, how are you in your relationship with Christ? Is that going well? These are the conversations as husband that you're leading out on how's that relationship with Christ going? Your calling, how are you doing in the calling that God has for your life? Okay, uh, now again, even if you're not married, are these things important and you can find someone to talk to about this? Yes. Okay, so even if you're not married, you can still apply these principles. Okay, checkbook. You're talking about finances. Are you both on the same page with what you're spending? Uh, Calendar. You're praying over the calendar. You're looking at the calendar. You're in agreement with what you're going over, what you have coming up. You're also talking about the previous week. Are we good with how we spend our time? Uh, Our time is valuable. You don't get your time back. So looking at uh, your calendar. Conflict. We talk about conflict. Now, how many know that's not fun? But unresolved conflict is bad. Conflict isn't bad, okay? But if it's unresolved conflict, then it's bad. And so making sure that we're on a weekly basis, just resolving conflict, that we're talking about conflict. Number six is your children, that you are talking about your children. The goal is this, that when your kids turn 19, and they, they're, whether, whether they, leave, they leave the house or not, or stay at home, the goal is that they would turn around and point their finger at you and say, you were my chief discipler in my life. That's your goal as a parent, okay? That's not my goal for, like, I'm not trying to be the chief disciple in your your kids' lives. That should be your job, your goal, that they would say that. And then the last thing is 
Uh, and I'll read this out of Ephesians 5.29. This last C is, <clears throat> and you can read all of Ephesians 5, and we'll wrap up here soon, but in Ephesians 5.29, uh, it says this regarding husbands to wives. <clears throat> For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but he will nourish and cherish it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and bones. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The last C is to cherish. And that's not a suggestion from God. That's a command. Okay? And uh, I know there's a book that I've enjoyed that uh, we've had. We've been talking about Pastor Jason and I've been sharing. Well, he had shared this with us. I love this statement here. It says, love will put up with a lot. Hmm. Would you like to be just put up with? Okay. Uh, but to cherish means to celebrate the best in someone. Question, would you rather be celebrated or tolerated? <laughs> okay. You would rather be celebrated, not tolerated, okay? Uh, so this is a, another excellent book uh, that I would recommend for you to read. But uh, understanding that that's a command from God, not a suggestion. And so to you women, this is what I would say. I would ask for you to keep an open heart to your husbands as they attempt this. Because they're not perfect, they got their faults and failures, and many times they're probably doing these things feeling like a hypocrite in many ways because they've already failed in these. Give them the space to fail. Give them the space to try this because we're not going to be perfect in this. You understand that? That it's a, not a thing that we're going to just walk out and do this with perfection. So uh, having the right mindset, and more than likely when I read those manhood things, those statements, the seven statements, you might have found yourself only being able to do one out of seven very good. Maybe six out of seven, you're just okay. Uh, but encourage them as they try to do this, where they're trying to meet with you on a, on a weekly basis. That's not a date. The date's something else. This is just a meetup, that you're talking about these essential things uh, to the relationship, but uh, we can't give up. We have to press in. We have to face our fears and do this. And then the last thing is this, the in-home discipleship of your children. What this looks like is this, is that based on their age uh, within Dad Lab, there is a, a small curriculum that, again, we can pass out when we do our three-hour session, but uh, there's an age-appropriate curriculum that, that can be taught and shared. And the goal is that 15 to 30 minutes a week that you're sitting down with your kids and you're talking about all the different relationships that are going on in life and that your, your goal is to bridge the gap between them and Christ. Your goal is to demystify what it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you become the bridge they need uh, to go to Christ, that you're laying that down and you're leading them to Christ. You become that bridge. And so that's that whole goal. And you're talking about all the different relationships in their world. You know it's important to ask them how their relationships with their pre-believing friends are at school and also how's your online relationships. When you, and I'll give grace to all the parents in here because you grew up without social media, yes? None of us grew up with social media. Now your kids are growing up with social media and you know there's people on there that pretend to be a 16-year-old girl but in fact it's some 30-year-old Nigerian man and somewhere conning them. That's a real thing and happens all the time, okay? So, parents, if you're being proactive in meeting that once a week, do you think you're probably going to be able to help work through some of those things? Yes. Does this sound like work? Yes. But anything, worth, anything in life requires work. If you think it's going to just come easy, you're mistaken. So, those are kind of the, the three key things there, uh, Pastor Gary, if you want to come forward, I didn't really plan this, but I really felt like for us to end on Father's Day, uh, and we'll go ahead and all stand, so we'll go, go ahead and we're going to conclude our service. Uh, one of the things, if you guys don't know this, Pastor Gary's a spiritual father to many of us, and I just felt like in my heart as I was preaching that you were supposed to give a Father's Day blessing to all the dads and just to release a blessing and that we were going to end with that. So whatever's on your heart to... Pray and release, and we'll be we'll conclude. Amen. It's a lot of good things to. I don't know if it's on. Sorry. I handed you a, a mic that wasn't on. A dud mic. <laughs> Not a dad mic. A dud mic. <laughs> a lot of good things to consider and and to meditate on. Amen. Well, Father, we just ask, Lord, even in concert with the prophecy of Malachi chapter four that. You will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. 
It's so important to you that if this doesn't get done, you will have to smite the earth with a curse. Lord, help us to be a part of the solution to the problem. We invite you, Lord, to put it in our hearts, to have a heart for our children and to reach out to them and to be the example you've called us to be. We ask a blessing upon every father here today. We ask a blessing upon their families, upon their children. Lord, we pray that you would give us give wisdom and divine guidance as we serve your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.